Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Season Gaming BitCast holiday special for 2017. So today, rather than our normal format, Bert and I are going to talk about all the biggest news stories of 2017 that happened across the gaming industry, and also take a look at our most anticipated games for 2018, as there's already a long list of them. So let's uh, let's start by taking a look at some of the biggest things from 2017, and the first of which is the Nintendo Switch. So the Nintendo Switch launched back in March. Uh, there were a lot of question marks coming into its launch with uh, Nintendo's Wii U not being a popular console, a uh, brand new Zelda game coming to both the Wii U and the Switch and whether or not it would be any good. Uh, you know, things like virtual console and the online service, the whole portability factor, all those things that were question marks about the Switch that now obviously uh, we know that it's uh, kind of surpassed or surprised everyone and it's become a huge hit. So Nintendo announced that it sold 10 million units in eight months. It's on pace to sell more units in a single year than the Wii U sold in its lifetime, which is obviously great news for fans and Nintendo alike. And we also know, of course, that uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey were both uh, two of the most critically acclaimed games of the year, both fantastic and uh, multiple, multiple uh, Game of the Year awards from many publications. So. We also know that third parties are lining up now due to the success of the system. Third parties are lining up to put games on the on the console, even games like, you know, Doom and Wolfenstein. Uh, and even some of the smaller Nintendo titles, things like Snipperclips and ARMS and those new franchises have sold well over a million units. Yeah, it's been kind of a surprise for me as well, because I didn't really know what to expect from the Switch from a software standpoint. As we kind of know, Nintendo's biggest challenges recently have been you know, what third parties are going to go on. We always know that first party stuff is going to be great, but, you know, is the third party stuff going to, are people going to start developing for it? Are they going to have the same third parties that they had before? So what a year for 2017 and Nintendo in general. Um, I'm still surprised at how some of the games still, you were just talking about ARM selling over a million. I didn't get that game as much as everybody else did. Um, and another one is Splatoon that we both don't get as to why so many people play it, but it's that Nintendo name, I think it is, and it's, it's even funny thinking back at the Nintendo Wii, which started you know, selling like crazy at the beginning. It sold over, I think, 100 million units. But if you think about software, the software was really lacking from third party, um, and then it was more of a gimmick. When people started figuring that out, software just quit selling like crazy. I think I remember reading something that the average Nintendo Wii owner has like one or two games, including Wii Sports. So um, when the U came out, Wii U came out, you had the controller issue um, that people were having issues with, even though I still actually play my Wii U at least once or twice a month um, month um, to kind of get out of it. But yeah, huge surprise for me. Um, I still have a lot of questions for the Switch in, as, in my head as far as what's going to happen. But you know, we both picked up a lot of games, so it was quite a year for Nintendo. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been quite good. It definitely surprised me. As you know, I said I was going to wait, and I ended up buying one ahead of time. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just mostly promising news. There are a few things, you know, that we've talked about that uh, Nintendo needs to resolve. So you have virtual console on the Wii and Wii U and people who bought those games on those consoles. You know, there's no virtual console support on the Switch, which is really ridiculous. Um, and then the new online service that they, uh, you know, they kind of premiered talking about early this year with the Switch, or was it even late last year? Um, but they've delayed it multiple times down to 2018. And there's even a rumor, I believe, that just came out earlier this week that it's going to be delayed again into late 2018 rather than early 2018. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But overall, mostly good news, I would say. Yeah, there was also that weird news story this week that um, they're going to be moving to a bigger cartridge or a little um, whatever you want to call those little cartridges that I think before they were maxed out at 32 gigs. Um, or actually, I think even less than that, then you could actually put on that card and they're going to be releasing a 64 gigabyte card that you could use for them. So um, I don't know. I think it's interesting. Nintendo's got such a such a powerhouse name that it sells just on that. And we haven't even seen like a, a real Pokemon game for the Switch yet or anything as far as it not being a remaster from the previous generation. So that was, I think I even made a video of it earlier, you know, where the remaster is going to continue to lead the way for Nintendo. Um, and if you think really hard, 2018, there's not that many AAA games that are either first party or third party that are coming um, that aren't either a remaster from last generation um, or going to be something completely new that we don't know about. We don't know anything about Bayonetta 3's launch date. We don't know anything about Metroid Prime's launch date. Um, those are potentially 2019. Um, after playing Wolfenstein 2 on Xbox One X and even seeing them on the PS4 Pro, PS4, and Xbox, 
I have no idea how they're going to get anywhere near the quality that was originally on those consoles on the Switch because as much as people love Doom and picked up Doom, uh, for me that was unplayable on the Switch. But you know, if you hadn't played it before and you are a Nintendo person, this is your first time seeing it, you probably were blown away. Um, I would simply say hey, try it on one of the other consoles. It's it's a whole other home of the game. But I don't know, yeah. Nintendo. Nintendo's Nintendo. We always kind of get confused. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean, it's been a big year, and then we haven't, even, you know, we've talked about it at length, but the SNES Classic was a huge hit as well, and then bringing the NES back. So good year overall for Nintendo. Um, you know, talking about good years, uh, this is the game that's all the rage, and I, I know uh, you've been a little outspoken on it, um, but it's definitely sucked me in, and a lot of my friends as well. Um, but PUBG. So PUBG's taken the kind of world by storm. It's probably the biggest game news story of the year. They've announced that over 30 million people have now played it across PC and Xbox. Uh, they think, based on some Steam numbers, they think 26 to 27 million of that is on Steam. Uh, we know it's sold over, you know, 25 million copies. And then, you know, you have those other people who have just played it on other devices or accounts. Um, and then, you know, to, to think that it's only been out uh, less than three weeks now on Xbox and it's already probably sold over a million and a half, two million copies with uh, maybe another million more having played it through game sharing or the like is just uh, kind of astonishing, you know, especially given the fact that the official release of the game on PC only happened last week and it's uh, still in game preview form on Xbox, of course. So it has taken the world by storm. Um, it is hugely, hugely popular. It's all over game streaming. It's blown Twitch up. It's on Mixer, uh, YouTube videos. You know, it's made um, famous some of the streamers who play it near daily. So it's it's really been interesting, and uh, I am loving it as well. I know you're a little more mixed on it, um, but it, it's definitely uh, it's definitely one of those games that's become a phenomenon similar in a in a way to minecraft you know when minecraft first launched it was in early access and no one really knew what it was and then it just obviously we know where it is today right um so pubg is kind of going down that same road and it'll be interesting to see if it continues um you know to to, to uh sell the way it has so far in 2017 into 2018. yeah it's funny because i'm i'm very mixed on it because um Number one, it started out really rough on Xbox <laughs> from a playability standpoint. But I do understand why people love it. I mean, it's a different experience every single time. Um, it was funny because when me and my buddy Vincent were waiting in line to see Star Wars, we were watching you on Mixer, and he's like, whoa, it's just one map? And it's like, oh, and it's just everybody versus everybody? And oh, I mean, it was just explaining it to someone kind of is difficult without showing it to them. But funny enough, Vincent was here last night, and he played it for the first time, and that's all he wanted to do the whole night. We had four <laughs> people over here. He's like, hey, let's just take turns um, and, and go into in that game. And um, I wish I could post his testimonial about the game. But um, it's crazy how that game grabs people, and then people are addicted. And um, I completely understand it. I'm, I'm, warm, I'm warming up to it a lot more as it's become more playable. I think I've always had that issue. It's just it was really rough for me to play compared, compared to all the other you know polished games. But... You know, when you understand that it's an early access game, it's a lot easier to absorb. But yeah, phenomenon is an understatement for this game for me. Yeah, and I think the biggest the biggest thing about it is they're saying console exclusive on the Xbox, and people are still questioning if that's true. I mean, it seems pretty clear to me that Microsoft in some way has secured it on the console space. But it does seem kind of crazy to think that um, they would somehow not see this game end up on PlayStation 4, given the PlayStation 4's popularity um, worldwide, and knowing, again, how, how big PUBG is becoming. So it'll be interesting to see in 2018 where that goes. We know, thankfully, as you noted, you know the Xbox launch was rough, and we knew it was kind of going to be rough with being game preview and them saying, you know, they kind of rushed it out in December. Um, but they've patched it twice already. They're, they're working on it quickly. I think Microsoft knows they have a big hit exclusive game on the Xbox. And so they're working pretty hard to get that, uh, you know, as polished as fast as possible. So we'll see where it goes. But, uh, you know, I'm going to be playing the hell out of it. I've been playing it near daily uh, when I have the time. And um, 2018 will be interesting to see how it continues to evolve. Yeah, well, what's your best final rank again? What was oh, that? don't start. How about this one? What, what was your fastest death? Like, what was your worst rank? <clears throat> Uh, I know playing with one of our favorite buddies yesterday. Um, <laughs> I want to say I was 99th or 98. Okay. I so landed was... and I got a fist fight with a guy, and another guy came over and killed me. So I mean, it was real. <laughs> it was real quick. Real quick. This will crack you up. So uh, I had all my buddies here last night, and I was like, "Oh, Vincent just finished 14th on his first time from just camping the whole time." 
And I'm like, hey, let me try. Let me show you guys how to play. And so I land. Um, and I'm like, hey, there's a little cliff here. I think I can just walk over the edge. Well, that edge <laughs> like kept going. And I was like, he's going to grab. His feet are going to grab. It's not that steep. And I ended up dying 98. That was 98. <laughs> All of them were like, Bert, you suck. Oh, that's weird. But, um, the cliffs yeah, in the game, your guy like floats, you know, like does. they, they tell the you never to jump down a hill because you just kind of keep going and going. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. That's And by the way, that's one of the thing on PUBGs is you'll load in, it'll take you five minutes to get going and you'll make that one mistake, but I bet you you'll never make that mistake again, <laughs> whatever it is you do. But um, yeah, it's probably yeah, that's, immensely. That's how I feel about, uh, now remember I only started playing this two weeks ago, but that's how I feel about my four second place finishes right now. Jesus. Not too happy about it. Uh, and I've got a third or two and a fourth and a couple fifths, probably about 15 to 20 top tens. And um, I don't have that win yet. So it's driving me a little nuts. You know how competitive I am. So you need on that chicken diet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so uh, kind of on the Xbox train here. So one of the other biggest kind of uh, releases in 2017 was the Xbox One X. Um, Microsoft, you know, debuted the whole Project Scorpio thing in 2016. They came into 2017 with a lot of rumors and speculation, and they did the uh, Digital Foundry kind of partnership prior to E3 to get all the specs out of the way and, and show that it was the powerhouse that they were touting. E3 came, the price was revealed, and many people were, um, you know, we weren't. I think we were expecting the price, but uh, which I'm kind of happy to say we we had a better le level of insight than I think some of the people who were saying it was going to be 399 or it couldn't compete, you know, if it was above 399. Uh, so it launched, it launched uh, well above expectations. Um, its sales were revised by many analysts because they had it at a certain number and they had to increase that. And it's been shown to be very popular. Um, it's not only lived up to uh, everything Microsoft has said it would be in the most powerful console and run games, you know, at a much higher level, similar to a higher spec PC. But we're hearing the same out of developers, and uh, you know, the proof is in the product, right? So, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been loving mine. Um, I know you're loving yours. We did a uh, a good video review on it. If uh, if you're looking for more information at this point in time on the Xbox One X, we have a nice long video review of it on our channel. Um, but uh, it's been um, it's been one of my favorite consoles in a long time, even though it's just a console refresh. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. It's a great form factor. It's a great piece of hardware. And uh, the way it runs games um, without any extra effort is uh, is pretty amazing. Yeah, I think we was probably the most excited we had both been in a long time for a new console. I remember launch night, we went, put it on our Facebook page. You know, we had pictures holding it and set up and ready to go. And <laughs> Um, thankfully, we were both 4K and HDR ready, so our TVs were simply plug and play and putting it in there. And I think we were scrambling to see which games we're going to play first and get them installed, and if we hadn't had them installed already. But um, yeah, I've been really happy with the Xbox One X, and um, I've been happy with the price point. Everything I, I have zero complaints on it. Um, the only complaints I would have, which is not Microsoft's fault, but uh, there's a few handful of games that I wish were enhanced that need to be enhanced sooner than later. So, Doom. Um, Doom is one of them. Pray. pray, and pray. Doom and Prey are probably my top two. Yeah, I mean, I got Witcher 3 yeah. now, which is all I'll need for the next three years. But uh. <laughs> you're, 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 you're off the grid again. After I remember the first time you were playing Witcher 3, I was like, hey, let's play Black Ops 1 or something, whatever was at that time. They're like, I'm in the middle of Witcher, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm back in it again. I've got probably seven, eight hours since last week. Whenever the time I have to play games that's not with you guys right now, I'm on Witcher again, and all the other games have gone back to the backlog, so it's terrible, but it is what it is. So anyway, uh, Xbox One X, yeah, we love it. Um, I know, you know, I speak to a lot of people within the community, and I, I rarely see a negative thing about it. Um, so it, it seems like Microsoft has really kind of hit a high note with the X, and I know they're, they're looking forward to carrying that into 2018 with some of the new um, IPs and bigger titles that we'll get to here shortly. Yeah, I know some people have asked the question, you know, is right now the right time to upgrade consoles, whether it's uh, the Pro or the X, uh, depending on, and I always have the answer for them. And, you know, if you have the, if you're that type of person that likes to be on the cutting edge of technology, or if you have a 4K HDR TV, you know, it, it's a must if, if you like having that. If you're just a casual gamer, um, there's still enhancements that you will see and enjoy, even if you don't have a 4K TV. But regardless of what you're looking for, if you're just entering Xbox, I mean, if you have the extra scratch, you know, buy it. There's really no reason not to. Um, you see it in a lot of different areas. So we've been we've been really happy with it. Yeah, in fact, I've got uh, one of the good buddies I play with, um, you know, 
all the time, every week. Um, he does not have a 4K TV right now. Uh, 1080p plasma, he's still on, and he went and bought an X, and uh, he's been impressed with it. You know, load times are much, much faster. Uh, if you're still on the OG Xbox One, you know, the form factor is is a huge difference, right? And um, he also noted, like, we were playing Battlefront 2 a couple weeks ago, and he was like, oh, my God, look at the detail on the outfits and the, you know, the uh, vehicles and everything. And I was like, yeah, and it just, you know, it compounds even further once you're on that 4K HDR setup. So uh, still worth it, even if you're not the you know, most advanced in your technical setup. Yeah, and, and let's do something real quick. Um, we hadn't talked about it before, but let's talk about Sony uh, PlayStation 4 really quick, just um, as far as what we think that happened throughout their year. So in my opinion, um, I, I think Sony kind of had a bit of a cruise control year. I think they kind of relied a lot on their, I'd say, a handful of exclusives and kind of stayed on that. We saw the Pro, I would say, fall behind a little bit when it comes to new tech and stuff. Um, and I feel like they are really riding on the PSVR train. Um, so we'll see if that continues in 2018. I know we have if some of these businesses we'll talk about, but I didn't really see anything that awed me from a console perspective from the PlayStation this year um, as it had in the past before the X came out and stuff. So, I mean... Were you blown away this year from from Sony from anything they did outside of the you know Persona Fives and Neo and, and a few of the exclusives that they liked? I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think you're right. They had they had the benefit of having some good first party exclusives. You know, Horizon Zero Dawn. We'll get to some of these games, like you said, but Horizon was a big hit. You know, it was an excellent game, one of my favorites of the year, um, which was a new IP, and so that made waves. And then they had the support of a lot of those Japanese company exclusives, right? So they had Persona Five and they had Neo. Um, they had uh, Nier, Automata, um, you know, all those games kind of came out in that first quarter into the second quarter, and it really gave them that early boost. Um, but from a hardware perspective, yeah, it's going to be, it's an interesting conversation, and we could probably talk longer about it, but w this is the first time we've seen these mid-cycle refreshes, and Sony went first, right? They went in 2016, they didn't make a big deal out of the Pro, it kind of launched alongside PlayStation VR, and so there was kind of one eye on each, right? Um, so when the Xbox One X comes out, Microsoft really pushes it as a new console, the best place to play, the you know, most powerful console on the planet ever made, what have you. Um, it really kind of overshadowed what Sony, or where Sony was with the hardware from the hardware perspective. And I think now we're in a cycle where we're at least two, I would say a minimum three years out from whenever the next consoles are gonna come. So I think from a hardware perspective, Sony's kind of done. You know, they may revise PSVR prior to the PlayStation 4's uh, um, term coming to an end. But uh, I think that Microsoft is gonna ride this, uh, ride the Xbox One X for the rest of this generation and Sony's gonna live, you know, purely from its from their games because they they have that um i don't know the word i'm looking for they have kind of the mentality across the industry right or wrong i don't care where you stand on it that they are the place to play the better exclusives um and so they're you know they like to ride that pretty hard yeah it'll be interesting to see if developers start seeing the extra power the x has to kind of you know you have a vision for your game and uh, you want that to turn into something bigger than what you're given from a hardware perspective to see if they go cross-platform in the future. But that's, as, as you mentioned, that's that's another conversation. Uh, the point that I was just simply making, it was, it was interesting for Sony. You know, they secured those exclusives in late 2016, 2017. A lot of people forget and a lot of people keep quoting Sony as they've always had all these exclusives. And honestly, they didn't. Uh, when the, At the start of this generation, it was a very cross-platform um, environment for both consoles. Um, a lot of this misinformation, as we've been talking about before, but you know we're in a different playing field now, and I think Sony is heavily riding on those exclusives into 2018 and probably through past spring of 2018. After that, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But 2017, like I said, cruise control Sony. Yeah. So, and either way you look at it, right? I mean, both Sony and Microsoft had very good years. Spending was up, you know, profitability for both was up. Sony announced they had the best Black Friday that they've had since PlayStation 4 launched. Microsoft uh, had uh, the most spending on the console segment between the Xbox One X, S, and, you know, their software around the holidays. So, I mean, it's been, uh, it's just been good all around for both. And, and that's where it kind of gets funny, right, for these people that are hardcore, one console or the other. Um, it doesn't really make sense because you know if we had a one console market you know the industry would be worse off <laughs> it's a very good thing that we have a healthy competition between microsoft and sony and we have nintendo doing their own thing i mean it's 
it's proof right now with revenue being higher than ever that um, all three can survive, be profitable and do well. It doesn't, it's not really a big deal, you know, to have uh, multiple like that. So um, moving into uh, one of the companies that had a rough year uh, from just a news perspective is Electronic Arts. So one of the biggest publishers, if not the biggest publisher, I don't actually know who's bigger between them or um, Activision. Uh, do you know by chance? I don't know which one's bigger from, uh, yeah. It's pretty close. I mean, they're, they're both up there. Regardless, um, everyone knows Electronic Arts. Uh, you know, they have a stigma about them, uh, usually negative, and this year kind of uh, showed that. So the started with Mass Effect Andromeda. The <laughs> I can't talk about the game without laughing as much as we've talked about it this year. Um, I did rebuy it to make you guys happy, you and Jordan happy. And uh, in 2039, I may go back and play it. But... <clears throat> um, yeah, with Andromeda bombing, as we know, uh, the DLC for the game got canceled. It, it you know, faced all the social media backlash. And uh, the team, Bioware Montreal, has now been shifted you know, to working on other electronic arts projects. And then they moved from that, and they shut down Visceral, one of our favorite franchises in gaming, one that I think us, along with many other people, were was going to make a comeback this generation with either a reboot or you know, a, a re something to do with Dead Space. Um, Visceral now shut down, and then uh, obviously more recently, the whole huge controversy around Star Wars Battlefront 2's loot boxes and microtransactions, which apparently did impact sales and EA's bottom line to a degree. Uh, so much so that, you know, there's all kinds of rumors and speculation around Disney's CEO himself uh, having a conversation with um, EA CEO about it. So it's been a, uh, just from a... <clears throat> not necessarily from a financial perspective, but just from a, a visual perspective or social perspective, Electronic Arts has faced a pretty tough year. Yeah, talk about having a PR nightmare. I mean, but, you know, EA's had the stigma for a long time now. I mean, they were, was it 2015 that they were the wor worst hated company in the world or something? I can't remember what year that <laughs> yes, was. Yeah, it was either 14 um, or 15, which is ridiculous in its own yeah. right, but it is what it is. Yeah, but uh, it's funny, and, and looking at a couple things before starting the, the BitCast today, I was just seeing the number of studios that EA has bought and closed down and people that were super excited about stuff. And, you know, gosh, now, now to think about it, Titanfall uh, might be going down the drain. <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's, I, I don't even know what to think of EA anymore. Um, the funny thing is they still have some games that we like, um, and they've also killed some games that we like. So I... I I hope 2018 is better, 2019, whatever's coming out in the near future. Um, one of the weird things is that they have been made fully aware from a social media standpoint of things that gamers don't like, but people continue to buy them. So on a lot of it's our fault as gamers. Um, but at the same time, EA is that company that says, oh, we're listening to you, we're listening to you. Um, but they still do it. And they said that they're bringing all that stuff back anyways. They might have retooled a little bit, but that stuff's still coming. So. I don't know, yeah. Get your crap together, dude. <laughs> yeah, and that leads into one of the other main topics, right? Is microtransactions and loot boxes. It became, it's been a conversation point that's been growing for the past probably you know couple years, but this year I feel like was the year where it really became a, a primary focus. Um, partly because of Battlefront Two, uh, there's you know other titles that uh, it just seemed loot boxes kept popping up in every single game, um, and I think that we're since we're in the early stages of of loot boxes in general uh, at a AAA game uh, format, I think that uh, developers and publishers have to figure out how they implement, you know, new ways to get profitability out of games while not, uh, you know, really impacting the user base or the competitiveness of a game like uh, happened with Battlefront 2. Um, and it's just, you know, I think we're in that, that rough period right now where they're trying to figure out the best way to do it. I think, especially after Battlefront 2, um, that developers and publishers alike will certainly be more cautious in their approach into how they implement games because uh, the sales numbers for Battlefront 2, I know, were far lower than anticipated given Battlefront 1 and the new Star Wars movie. Um, so we'll see what happens. But I, it's just, it's one of those things where, if, you know, it's become such a negative aspect of games that even games like, you know, what's a good example? Maybe Forza 7? Um, where they add crates into the game that really have no negative impact on the gameplay. You don't have to spend any real money on, um, but it gets a negative, uh, as you kind of said, stigma about the game simply because they're in the game. You know, um, it's it's really gotten to be that toxic within the gaming community. So I, I don't know where we go from here, but um, 
you know, you, Jordan, and I talked about this at length in a uh, season game conversation earlier this year. And we may have to go back and have a kind of an updated conversation because this has been one hell of a year for it. Yeah, microtransactions in, in general for me, I've, I'm always just kind of weird about it. I, it, I don't understand them. Um, I've never really bought one before. I think I bought one Batman outfit in one of the Ar Arkham games that was, like, I guess, considered a microtransaction, but it, it being a single player game it doesn't really benefit me in any way whatsoever besides having Batman look different. Um, but it's interesting to see how your casual gamer will still spend a lot of money on microtransactions. Because if you think about it really hard, the main people that are complaining are your hardcore gamers, your very passionate crowd that's been following a franchise or maybe been waiting for that game to release for a while. They're the only ones that are really going to say something on social media. But you got to keep in mind your hardcore gamers is not the, the big number of the gamers that exist out there and that actually buy games. So. Until those people quit buying stuff and microtransactions, I think these companies are going to continue to do it. 2017 was a crazy year for them. So um, I don't know. It's I hope they go away in some form, but I have a feeling the publishers are going to continue to try to get creative on how to do it um, and still get money out of people without pissing people off. But there's a lot of angry people this year when it came to microtransactions. I swear every piece of social media that I would see is people just railing on it all the time. Yeah, and, and it's frustrating because a lot of it is misconstrued, right? We had people bitching about games that they never even played, um, which is really kind of frustrating for people like us that do play all these games and realize that a lot of people are getting it wrong. Um, but then, you know, in other instances like Battlefront 2 and, and a few other games, um, it, can be, uh, it can be pretty bad as well. So we've got to figure out a balance there. It's funny you mentioned about you not buying any. Um, I think the, the game that I've bought the most for is your favorite game, uh, Smite. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> um, but then again, it's a different model, right? Smite's a free to play game. Um, and I have hundreds and hundreds of hours into that game. And so, you know, I purchase things because I like to support developers. And so they've provided me hundreds of hours of entertainment. And so I've, you know, I've spent some money on things within the game. But like I said, that's a free to play game. I think the conversation really gets muddy when you start talking about, you know, the full price game, $60 games that then have people spending an extra 50, 60, hundred dollars on things within the game. So, yeah. And I think that kind of, um, I guess we can talk about it really quick, but games as a service, you know, is a little different. Cause I mean, as you're saying free to play and you're, you're buying additional things for your game that you like a lot. And it's a lot different from like someone buying a collector's edition for like $150 and it comes with all this stuff. And then it's like, Oh, actually we have some more stuff that you need to buy. Um, it turns into microtransactions at that point when you're spending that much for a game, you should be getting, all the costumes or all the cool things, unless it's some kind of like a Halloween or a Christmas event that the game's doing or something. But game as a service, I think is another thing that kind of took off in 2017 and that people are claiming they're not a game as a service, <laughs> Destiny, um, but you're just a, a normal <laughs> game that's at full price. And if not more than that, that you're still charging for stuff down the line and changing the game um, while it's actually evolving throughout that DLC. Yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't listening. I was doing a strike for the 4,000th time. No, wait, what? <laughs> um, all right, let's go, let's go ahead and move on before we get completely off track here. So um, one of the biggest things we heard, uh, and you know, you're talking about games as a service, and one of the biggest things we heard along those, those lines, the games as a service and microtransaction, is single player games are dead. Um, this obviously is just another stupid phrase that got passed around the industry. I don't know who starts these things or who kind of keeps them going. But I quickly, just off the top of my head, in about 20 seconds, typed out, as an example, just this year, we had Resident Evil 7, Zelda Breath of the Wild, Horizon Zero Dawn, Prey, Hellblade, Persona 5, Mario Odyssey, Wolfenstein 2, Assassin's Creed Origins, Evil Within 2, and Cuphead. And all, however many games I just touted off there, 10, 11 games there, are spectacular games. They're all single player. A few of them you can put hundreds of hours into. Um, many of those, in fact, I think we might have covered all the Game of the Year nominees right there between, uh, you know, Zelda and, and Mario and Wolfenstein 2. Um, it, it's just ridiculous to hear that single player games are dead. It's not true. Um, hopefully it's never true because we love these experiences. And uh, it was great to have a year where franchises that have been around for a while, like Resident Evil, Persona, Wolfenstein, uh, Zelda, Mario, Assassin's Creed, um, it was great to have a year where those, uh, the new versions of those games, the, the sequels of those games did so well. And then we had new IPs like, uh, Prey being kind of reborn, you know, it really didn't have many ties to the, the old Prey from 2006, 
Horizon Zero Dawn, you know, Cuphead lived up to expectations. So just a, a fantastic year for single player games. And uh, I hope that never changes. Yeah, to, to refresh memory on who said that, it's guess who, uh, Electronic Arts. The president uh, mentioned that, you know, single player games are, are going away and people don't want to play them anymore. So I, when, I, when I heard that, it kind of shocked me because I'm more of a single player uh, gamer. Um, I only play multiplayer if uh, people are playing something and they really want to play and it's not scheduled with uh, people that evening or during the day. Um, I'm usually playing a single player game. And so when I heard that comment, I was like, what are you talking about? Um, but there is, there's a lot of people, you know, as I mentioned, the casual gamers will buy, you know, Call of Duty. Um, or a Madden or something like that. And then that's all they play um, and they go online the whole time and they repeat the same thing over and over or Destiny or whatever the case is. So um, I don't know. It's interesting. I, it, you know, 2017's best games, when you think of all the publications talking about it, every single one of the games mentioned now that I think about it is a single player game. Um, I can't think of any multiplayer game that is even a nomination for Game of the Year. No, P PUBG got a yeah. few Game of the Years simply because of, like we said, the cultural phenomenon it's become. But from a Game of the Year technical perspective, it's been None. its majority has been Zelda. <laughs> yeah, because it, it, it is. <laughs> All right. Anyways, um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, and you you touched on something there um, real quickly that I think uh, is is really pertinent, and that is that the gaming industry is so big now um, that there's room for everything. Like I was just saying about you know how there's plenty of room for Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch to all be profitable. The same goes for games. You know, we have games like Destiny, like um, Call of Duty or Battlefield is games that people put thousands of hours into from a multiplayer perspective. But, you know, games like uh, Horizon and Resident Evil and Zelda and Mario are highly profitable as well and sell millions and millions of copies. There's no reason we can't have both. There's plenty of money being spent on gaming to support both. And I think uh, it was nice to see a company like Bethesda kind of come out and almost counter EA and say, look, single player games are, you know, what we do. You know, they released Evil Within 2 and Wolfenstein 2 and Doom. And, uh, you know, they do Elder Scrolls and, you know, one of the biggest games in the world, right? And Skyrim. Hell, they're still releasing it six years later, which we've talked and about. And Fallout. And Fallout. You know, I mean, these are all single-player games that are, uh, again, they're, they're cultural phenomenons in their own right. Um, so it's there's no reason you can't have both. I, I think that's just a very stupid statement, especially by someone who is as high up as he is. Patrick yeah. uh, Sutherland, I believe his name. I can't remember the name. I just remember he was an EA president of some sort. I don't know if it was marketing or something, but yeah, it's. I, I think it's another one of those um, executives that's just trying to sell their product and not realizing how ignorant of a statement it is. But you know, to me, it's just kind of funny. It's like, I mean, you are so out of touch, or you're just trying to sell your product and ignoring reality. But we're used to that these days with the way the world is. Yeah. So just a couple more things for 2017, and then we'll start talking about our most anticipated 2018, and that is uh, gaming subscription services. So things uh, that launched in 2017 included uh, Xbox Game Pass, which is, uh, you know, we've loved. It's a great service, $9.99 a month on Xbox, and you have access, I think, to around 130 games now that you can download and play just like you bought them digitally. We've talked about that in the past. Um, you know, Jump launched the indie game service on PC and uh, I had a good conversation with them a couple weeks ago, which uh, is on the site and up on our YouTube channel. And, um, you know, that is a really unique service as well with some really neat technology behind it. And if you want to learn more about that, please, I, I encourage you to check out my interview um, with Anthony Palma, who's the CEO of Jump. Uh, PS, PS Now, excuse me. So PlayStation takes a slightly different approach. Uh, and they're more of a streaming service, but that catalog continues to expand as well for old PlayStation classics that you can play. And then Electronic Arts, going back to them, uh, EA Access is a little different as well. It's more of a smaller service, but they announced that that's going to be coming to additional platforms in the future as well. Um, so it seems, you know, we're not sure if that means the Switch, which would be really interesting. Or if Sony has changed their tune and and are now going to allow EA access on uh, PlayStation Four, but either way, it's uh, it's good to see that expanding. So I think over the next couple of years, and we're going to start to see this uh, grow as well from an indus industry perspective. And uh, again, you know, Jordan, you and I had a conversation on this earlier in the year to to put our thoughts there. So if you're interested in you know hearing more about subscription services or what we think about them, you can find that out there as well. 
Yeah, I mean, um, Nintendo's streaming service is pretty good too. I usually like when I can lock. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even catch it. I was like, "Where's he going with this? Is there something I'm unaware of?" <laughs> oh man, I lost it there for a second. But no, I, I it'd be interesting to know what the point I'll make on it is. You know, we have no online service at all from Nintendo, um, and we probably will not get a subscription service. I know there was a rumor um, when the online service talked about they were talking about having like, was it uh, an NES game or something for that month? And the second that month ended, and the license for that would expire on your. Yeah, it was, like, you, uh, it was like an NES and Super NES uh, game that you would get for the 30 days of that month yeah. that you could play as much as you want, and then the next month would have two other games. But then they came out and said that they're changing the model, whatever that means. So I thought that was funny, um, considering you know you can get those for free if you really, really, really wanted to as ROMs anywhere, but um, kind of funny. But I don't know. Uh, we'll see. I, I, I do think that this model will expand. We talked about it at length in our um, season gaming conversations, and uh, I think it'll change more. So let's see what happens. Yeah. And then the final point as an all up for the gaming industry is that, uh, you know, the gaming industry continues to grow. It is the art form that we love. Um, you know, obviously that's why we do this and it's good to see that it continues to grow. But in 2017, it looks to be the year and the numbers aren't final yet. We won't know yet, but it looks to be the year that it's going to surpass $100 billion in worldwide revenue uh, for the gaming industry. And that is just astounding. Um, to put that in perspective, I, I looked this up. There's uh, the box office worldwide revenue in 2016, uh, and and growth was flat in 2017. Is 40 billion, around 40 billion, 39 to 40 billion. So it just goes to show you how big video games have gotten worldwide, and how much people are spending on them. Um, it's becoming the biggest industry, or if it's not the you know the biggest kind of entertainment industry, and uh, it just continues to grow. So. Um, I think in terms of, you know, all these things we were talking about around single player games and games as a service and microtransactions and all these things, I think gaming is just going to continue to grow and consoles are going to be bigger. Games are going to be bigger. There's going to be more selection. And the uh, infamous word that we talk about all the time with the backlog, I don't think we are ever going to catch up because there's just not enough time to play the amount of games that come out nowadays. Um, so really you kind of have to pick and choose and just play what you love because the industry is just gonna continue to expand. Yeah, and I think uh, the industry has changed so much. I remember, I remember when we were kids, gaming was like the reason for violence and all the stuff that was happening in the 80s and 90s. And there's still that stereotype of, you know, you're a gamer, so you immediately have, you know, two inch thick glasses and, you know, you have a lisp and you don't have any friends, etc. I mean, there's all these issues. Yeah. Just you're pretty much a dork. Is pretty much it. And um, geez, I, so I, I think being, like, I guess, a, a geek is what is, is what people call them. Um, is is slowly going away. I think video games is turning into just another hobby that people have. Um, you know, there's definitely going to be extremes in any in any hobby. Um, but it's fun that it's no longer in that uh, little stereotype of what it used to be. And I. I can't even tell you the stuff that you know we probably grew up with everybody thinking that we're some kind of a loser or something because the game um, but now it's it's bigger than almost everything music movies everything and people are, are loving it so it's good yeah, to see yeah it's really neat to see yeah um and i think it's neat that we're at an age um where we so we witness this firsthand right because we we grew up with uh the atari 2600 and back when the industry was next to nothing and saw when the nes released um, and kind of saw, you know, Super Mario Brothers for the first time and what that meant to us. And all those experiences I look back on now, which are now, you know, over 30 years old. Um, but it's neat to say that we've been there for the majority of it, which is pretty cool. Really quick on that, uh, when you mentioned that, you know what I find funny is the younger uh, folk these days, someone that's, let's, let's, give it, let's throw a number out there, 15, 16, 17 years old, that considers themselves a retro gamer, <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> and that's all they play. And um, so they're they're playing like NES or Super Nintendo. And um, to me, that's just kind of funny because that's what we just kind of grew up on, it and that was that. But I guess it's the same as like you know a 15, 16 year old that listens to CDs or something. It's um, and nothing else. But it just cracks me up. That's all. It's a short, short topic. Nothing else. No, no, it's funny. And I agree because hearing that, right? Someone's like, "Oh, I play the Super Nintendo," as if it's you know, it is a classic now. But I, I remember when it came out, and I was blown away, right? Seeing Super Mario World, Mario World, and uh, just being like, "Oh my God, this is amazing!" But um, to your point, I, I saw someone on Reddit. This was a, a little while ago now, but they were trying to make a point about them being an old school gamer, 
and he said, I've been gaming since the PlayStation <laughs> 1. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I, I thought he was making a joke about he's a younger gamer. He was actually trying to make the point that he's been gaming a long time. And I'm like, is this guy serious right now? Um, but yeah, if you started on the PlayStation 1, hey, more power to you. But uh, you're, you're not a classic gamer. I'm sorry. It, yeah, I think my first, my first gaming console that I played, I think actually... I've got the Atari 7800 over there, but the 2600, and then I really got into games. Funny enough, it was Oregon Trail on the Apple IIe in elementary school. <laughs> That's that all really, of us, all yeah. of us at our age. Yeah, you died of dysentery or whatever, so. Um, I, could never, I could never cross a goddamn river. You die every goddamn time. You just got that up, down, left, right arrow. That's all you could. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways, all right. So that's uh, 2017 at a glance. It's been uh, it's been an interesting year uh, for games. A lot of good things happened. Uh, mostly good things, I would say. Really, uh, we got two new consoles. We got a ton of amazing software. In fact, um, you know, I was having this debate the other day, and again, I don't think we want to get into it because we're going to go off track here. But um, is 2017 the year where we finally topped 2007 for the best game year? Um, and you know what? Maybe we'll do a topic on that here in one of our future big casts because we need to spend some time on that. But to give you an idea of 2007, 2007 was the year that Bioshock, Halo 3, Mass Effect, Portal, Assassin's Creed, um, all of those came out within like a four month span. So, you know, you look at 2017 and you think, God, has any year ever been this good with games? And 2007 kind of has held that title for the past decade. So we'll talk about that in a future big cast. But yeah, a couple others just to uh, tease you with our awesome topic in the future <laughs> is uh, Modern Warfare came out that year, too. Yeah, did, you, yeah. did you mention Uncharted? Uncharted, Uncharted. another one. Yep. And then uh, people's arguably favorite Mario until um, Odyssey yeah. came out, but Mario Galaxy. Galaxy. Yeah. yeah. And that was people gave that like a 10 and reviews god of war uh too um so i don't know there was just so many big games in 2007 so yeah I, I in my opinion i think this is the the best year in gaming as far as overall content that's you know triple a from a review standpoint i mean man there's it's it's crazy hmm. yeah well we'll uh we'll have to go back and revisit that so we'll do that soon but for now let's move to 2018 so 2018 is uh, rapidly approaching here in just a few days um, game releases, you know, we had a couple scheduled real early in the year and in February, a few of those have gotten pushed back now, but, uh, regardless, we already know that many of these games are releasing in 2018. And then there's several we're going to touch on that could be 2018, but maybe 2019 or beyond. Um, but let's start with the ones that, uh, we know are releasing in 2018. So the first big one I can think of from a release date standpoint is Monster Hunter World. And I touched on this a uh, big cast or two ago. I, I played the PlayStation 4 beta. I'm playing on the Pro. And I was pretty excited for it. I've never really been into the franchise, but um, I heard it has kind of Dark Souls-ish combat combined with, like, you know, an open world for monsters and hunting, obviously. And uh, I played it for about 45 minutes to an hour, and I know that's not a lot of time, so I'm still open-minded to it, but I, I was not really that impressed. And I know people are really excited for this game. Um, but I just didn't really get the fascination. I didn't really care for the world design too much. Fighting the main hunt I was on, the main monster, really wasn't thrilling uh, in any way. And uh, I just I don't know if I'm going to get into it, but I know that this is a, a big one. So I don't know. I don't know what to say about this one, honestly. Yeah, I've, I was never a Monster Hunter fan. So um, this is their, this is another franchise that has a massive following, um, and people can't wait to see it. The thing that's interesting to me when it came out was that it is not coming out on a Nintendo console for the best experience. So you're going to be playing this on PlayStation 4 or Xbox One, and uh, that's where kind of the power of, of those consoles will kind of override Switch. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I was not into the demo either. Um, but in seeing social media, people loved it. I mean, I was like, wow, you really love that game because I, I did not get the same experience as you did when I played that. But um, it's one of the first big games of the year, so we'll see how it sells. I, I think it's not going to sell that great, actually. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, it's always been a hit on the 3DS and the portable side, but um, you know, whether that mainstream audience, the, the Call of Duty crowd, for lack of a better term, we always seem to go back to Call of Duty. Um, I don't know if they're going to be picking it up, so we'll see. The next big one uh, just got pushed back by a month, but that's the first title of 2018 that I'm hugely excited for, for uh, tr from a AAA perspective, and that's Far Cry 5. 
So uh, this looks to be uh, crazy as Far Cry usually is. It looks to take it a step further than the previous ones. You know, we're fighting in the U.S. on this one. Um, we, I won't even get into my thoughts on religious cults or religion, <laughs> but uh, the fact that you're fighting a crazy religious cult in Montana, um, definitely intriguing to me. And uh, the fact that they're showing kind of multiple character perspectives and all sorts of vehicles and, you know, dogs chasing around and just all kinds of, absurdness i love and uh, i'll be all, all over this one when it releases yeah i this is kind of like this goes back to me with um assassin's creed games but i usually wait for a while to buy the far cries uh they've been very repetitive for me um this one however looks very different it's something fresh and different i actually skipped far cry primal um it, to me it was just kind of meh but um all three four i have uh actually i didn't even finish four uh, wow it's like i'm trashing the franchise now <laughs> um <laughs> I just wait is all I'm saying. And I, I think that if Far Cry 5 blows people away um, and is just being reviewed just amazingly well and, and you like it and our friends like it, I'll probably pick it up sooner than I usually do. But um, yeah, it is going to be one of the most anticipated games at the start of the year. And um, the subject matter, as you mentioned, very interesting because uh, I I feel like um, 2017 was like the year of killing Nazis. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like bleeding into 2018 a little bit. So should be fun, though, to kill those Nazis. <laughs> all right uh probably the biggest game of the year i would guess um red dead redemption 2 so this is my number one most anticipated game that i know is coming out in 2018 um it is red dead redemption the first one's one of my favorite games of all time red dead redemption 2 just thinking about playing that game on the xbox one x already kind of makes my mouth drool a little bit um it's gonna be stunning we know what Rockstar is capable of. GTA V is a, was an amazing title as well and continues to sell ridiculously well. Um, it's just, there, there, I could go on forever about this one. When this comes out, I will probably take some days off of work and you won't see me for a while. <laughs> a little dark over there. <laughs> no, I, I think from a single player perspective, this is my most anticipated game as well. I loved the first one and even the DLC was fantastic in the first one. I have a feeling they're probably going to do some really great DLC in this one too. I just hope it doesn't get delayed again. For some reason, I feel it might get delayed again, but that'll be, if it does get delayed again, it'll be the third delay, I think. Um, we'll see, though. Yeah, if they do push it to fall for whatever reason, um, other publishers may shit themselves because nobody's going to want to release around the time the Red Dead Redemption 2 releases. Um, so I think right now, you know, you're, the other games we'll touch on here that maybe think in a September, October release of 2018 are going to, uh, would be in trouble if that happens. <clears throat> so the next one is uh, the first big exclusive um, to the Xbox next year. And we've talked about this one quite a bit and that's Sea of Thieves. So we got the release date, it's March 20th. And it, uh, we also received recently, which was uh, kind of addressed some of the major concerns that people had were around the progression system. You know, I, I've played Sea of Thieves, had a ball with it. But even for me, the question was, you know, what, what's the hook? What, what's going to bring people back to play this game over and over again? Like uh, people would do with Destiny or other games of the service we've talked about. Um, and they kind of talked about some of that. So there's going to be kind of different clans and different quests and um, all kinds of different things you can do for leveling your character, making them look unique and stuff. So I, I thought that was really neat. And I'm pretty excited about this. I got to say that I'm hoping some of our friends get on board because, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot more fun if we have a group that plays it. But um, that <laughs> that's been hit or miss lately. So we'll see. But I think this is going to be a good one. And I hope that um, uh, Rare... Um, you know, goes all in on it, and they really just continue to revise it and make it better over the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I think that that is the biggest issue that I've heard with the game is that it's it's a multiplayer game, and that it's really hard to have as much fun as you do multiplayer wise, single player wise. So um, I have not had the luxury of playing it. I've only seen footage. I was not in the alpha or beta or anything like that. So. We'll see how it goes, but Microsoft is writing a lot on this game, and um, I hope that it releases and kind of delivers on the anticipation it's been built up for, because it's been talked about for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, it so, has. That's all I can really say about it. I don't know much about it outside of that. It looks fun. I love the art style. Um, that's it. Yeah, when you when you first get out onto a ship or a boat, what, what have you, and you stand on the, uh, the front of it there, and you look out into the ocean, the water and the you know, the, the effect that the sun, just the way it looks is absolutely stunning. Um, I was just absolutely blown away. 
it's in, it's incredible so it's really neat. and of course it's rare it's got that classic kind of british sense of humor which makes it a lot of fun as well you find yourself smiling and laughing quite a bit while you're playing so that's good um one of the big exclusives for the playstation 4 coming in 2018 which is highly highly anticipated is spider-man um, we know it's coming and Sonic games making it uh, it looks to even have pulled some of the things they might have learned from Sunset Overdrive, one of our favorites. Um, it looks quite good. Now, for me, personally, I'll probably buy it. I'll probably enjoy it. But I'm not really a Spider-Man fan. I'm not a big comic guy anymore. You know, I was when I was a kid. But I don't really care for Spider-Man as a character. Um, so I'm not as hyped about this as some people are. But um, I do think it looks amazing. I trust Insomniac to make a fun game. And anything where you can kind of fly around the world like that openly and, you know, just do things, uh, I always seem to enjoy. So I think this will be a big one for, for Sony in 2018. Yeah, I, so this is one that Sony's writing a lot. So you're, I was just talking about Sea of Thieves, Microsoft. But um, Sony is writing a ton on, on Spider-Man, not only because they have the license for Spider-Man, but because this game is kind of their big... Uh, exclusive for the start of the year, and that's really it. We don't really have anything else coming from Sony like we did in 2017 at the start of the year. So I, I don't know. I, I do think that we are going to see some surprises from the story. There's been a few teasers of Miles Morales, who's the other Spider-Man that's not Peter Parker, is going to have a major role in this game. And I think they're going to have a lot of villains outside of just one main villain like they have had another Spider-Man. So I think that's going to pull people in. Um, I was a little bit surprised that this got pushed out to, what is it, June? June of 2018 is a tentative date. Um, oh, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know if we have a date. Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, because um, it's June's my birthday, so my, my wife was talking about, hey, you're going to want that for your birthday. I think that was a tentative date that was given, but it might be like one of those typical um, middle of the year, just, you know, typical dates that's there, kind of like at the end of the year, they just put 12-31-2018. So I think they're going to have, they're aiming to have it done in the first half of the year is what I think is happening. Um, but I, I don't know. I like it a lot. I think they've taken elements out of the Arkham, uh, Batman story as far as gameplay goes and the way they tell the story uh, from a narrative perspective it's very very similar uh, when I first saw all the footage for it the first thing I thought is wow that's Arkham and Uncharted meld them into uh, Spider-Man series so um, I don't know it looks cool but at the same time we, we need to see more out of it um, I, at least I do um, but it's far out for me so I, it's not really too far off my mind yeah, and I think, um, you know, I quickly looked up to see that, and, and you're right, I think it was GameStop it said there that put June 30th mm -hmm. as a potential release date, so we'll see. I mean, I'm not sure, um, I believe, no, never mind, lost my train of thought, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, another big exclusive, uh, going back to Xbox this time, is Crackdown 3. So Crackdown 3 was originally supposed to release with the Xbox One X on November 7th. Um, it got pushed back. Uh, the presentation at E3 caught some flack. You know, it wasn't, it didn't really blow people away uh, in the in the vein that uh, I think Microsoft was maybe hoping it would. Uh, what they showed wasn't too intriguing. You know, the whole Terry Crews thing is awesome. I think he's great, um, but I I don't know. Um, you know, I don't think they've shown enough of the game yet, especially the 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 biggest hook and the most intriguing thing about it, which is the fully destructible city in the multiplayer. They really haven't shown that um, on a live stage yet. So we'll see. I, I am really excited for it. Uh, as I was just saying, any any open world game where you can kind of go around the city and do what you want, I seem to like. So this is four player co-op open world um, with all kinds of super abilities. And then in the multiplayer, from the sounds of it, it sounds fantastic, but we've got to see it in in uh, in play to really know what to expect. But I would expect this game to get a lot of polish before they release it. Microsoft does not want another big franchise of theirs to go kind of the ReCore route. Um, sad, sad to say, because I liked ReCore. But they don't want Crackdown 3 to come out and get 6s and 7s. They just don't. Um, so I think with Sea of Thieves coming earlier in the year, I would expect Crackdown 3 personally to come probably third quarter, you know, maybe August, September time frame prior to the huge AAA third party releases. Um, that's just my guess. I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, but were you wondering what the hook going to be? You mentioned hook a couple times. Oh my gosh. No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry, you know, you know you're going to be able to change that next year finally. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's a joke, guys. Uh, my gamer tag on PlayStation has been hooking to be since 1998 or something, and I can't change it, so it's just kind of funny. He gives me a hard time all the time about it. But um, I think Crackdown, uh, it has to be good, because if that fails, or funny enough, I, I had heard rumors that they were talking about canceling it um, back 
in late uh, 2017, sorry, after E3, there was rumors that it was so rough that they needed to clean it up. If that does not launch well, Microsoft's going to get crapped on by everybody in social media. So I think they're, they've gone back. I think they're going to be changing a lot of stuff from what we used to see. Um, but however, I love the first one and the second one. So I, I hope it's good. That's all I can say. And it's, it's, it's got the potential of being really good, but also the potential of being really bad. So I just hope it's not one of those. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a big question mark right now. It's probably one of the biggest question marks that we have on the list here. Um, but as you said, we want it to be good. And the you know, the feature set that is um, being offered in multiplayer is rather unique. And if they just pull that off, the promise of it is so intriguing that I really hope they do it. Um, so going back and forth again here, another big exclusive, but for PlayStation 4 is God of War. Um, this looks to be a almost like a reboot even or maybe a you know reboot in the form of a sequel um it looks really interesting um it's gotten a lot of press already they're already kind of uh advertising the game it's really weird because i've been watching you know i always watch podcasts and other things from other game networks and uh i'm seeing full-on advertisements for god of war for playstation 4 yet we don't even have a release date yet um so sony is you know we go back to the whole sony hype train they they do that a lot and um, it'll be interesting to see how this one turns out because we've seen all the uh, cinematics uh, that we saw originally at E3. What was it, last year? Or I can't remember if it's 2015 or 2016 now, but we've been seeing it for a while. Yeah. But when we actually saw gameplay, um, it didn't really look too great. So I, I don't know. I don't know if, again, they're just taking their time to polish it up because this is such a big franchise for Sony. And I'm sure expectations will be so high that they've got to get it right. So we'll see when this one comes out. Similar to Crackdown, I, I wouldn't surprise me to, to see this game a little later in the year, though they continue to say that this game will be out in the first half of 2018. So we'll see. Yeah, it's been my ongoing joke on these and all other conversations that we had that we're going to see God of War for the fourth time at an E3, um, which is kind of sad. So it was originally announced 2014. First footage started coming out in 2015. We saw more 2016. We saw more again 2017. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, let me actually pull it up here while we're talking. But I believe that this is another game that has a tentative calendar date of June 2018. And yeah, what that because, means, because they said first half. That's yeah, why. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do believe that Sony has four big games that uh, I'll just name them really quick and we'll talk about them that are all supposed to be in the first half of 2018 with no solid release date. And that's God of War, we touched on Spider-Man, uh, Detroit Become Human, and Days Gone. Days Gone is another one that's been talked about forever. Um, but yeah, it's funny. Sony does that. They did that with Gran Turismo like uh, almost two years before the game came out. They were advertising for it. They've actually thrown Death Stranding into some of the advertising as well, which is crazy to me that you can do that. Um, and God of War has been in a lot of their advertising for a long time, as well as Spider-Man, and we don't even have release dates for it. So I wish Sony would quit doing that because a lot of people think they can go buy a PlayStation 4 and they can buy that game. I've actually seen it happen at a GameStop. So, yeah, whatever. and I think, uh, just to be clear on Gran Turismo, I think at this point, we need to ban that game from being mentioned on this podcast until, <laughs> <laughs> until Polyphony Digital gets their shit together. Um, hey, okay. you want to know the crazy thing? Is Did you see the sales numbers for that game? Yeah, yeah, baffling. All right, yep. that game's... And it's mostly Europe and Japan. Um, that game's name, I mean, Gran Turismo just holds that level of clout. And yes. um, which, again, 20 years ago made sense. The game was amazing. Um, it hasn't been amazing in a very long time. Um, it's, yeah. it's, as a car guy or car guys, um, it's frustrating because there's better games and it doesn't deserve that level of, uh, of mention, uh, which is kind of where my joke was coming from. Yeah, well, this is the crazy part: is Gran Turismo Sport was the highest selling game in the U in the United in eh, European Union. I still can't talk. <laughs> what was that? In the <laughs> hey, for 2017. Who could, makes who could it be? You know what hey, I mean? Take it easy. But no, yeah, they they did better than FIFA, which makes no sense to me because FIFA is always you can almost it's kind of like Madden. You think Madden's going to be the highest selling game next to Call of Duty in the United States, but. Um, Gran Turismo was the highest selling game in the EU um, for 2017. Crazy. It's zero sense. Yeah. 
Anyway, um, got two more here that we know are confirmed for 2018. Uh, one of them you just touched on, so we'll go to that one first, and that's Detroit Become Human. Um, so from David Cage, another uh, PS4 exclusive here. As I've mentioned before, I was really, really intrigued by this game. I still am, um, but the, the most recent footage we had of it, well, let me back up. The footage we got of it for at E3 this year, um, I didn't like. I didn't think it looked very good. It looked stiff. Um, the writing was okay, but it just it just didn't really do much for me. And then we got the very controversial footage uh, from Paris Games Week, I believe it was, uh, with the um, basically the domestic abuse demo, which uh, kind of shocked some people. But of course, you know, I'm one that is. Um, I, I personally believe that we need to start tackling larger topics in games. You know, those uh, things like domestic abuse and drug addiction and, uh, you know, mental illness, all those things I think should be tackled in games just like they are in books and movies. Um, so I thought it was pretty, uh, pretty neat to see that uh, despite the content. And uh, that, again, now has me more interested in the game. So we'll, we'll see what this is like when it releases and, you know, what critics think of it um, like ourselves. But... I don't know. Right now, it's again, right now it's a big question mark for me, but I am looking forward to seeing more of it. Yeah, my biggest thing is um, I tried so many times to get through Heavy Rain, and um, I struggled so bad, mainly because the controls were horrible um, for Heavy Rain. And then I never actually picked up Beyond Two Souls, which I kind of regret because um, I really want to kind of play it now. But I, don't, I think there's actually a PlayStation 4 remastered version, not a remake, which I want to give a try to. Mm -hmm. um, but this game was released back in, uh, sorry, announced back in 2015. It's been delayed so many times. It's a, and I feel like I'm going to crap on Sony all the time here, but the games that are in the first half of 2018 have had massive delays. Um, and that's always made, massive delays for me are either a really good thing for the game or a really bad sign of what's going to be coming out. Um, and so, yeah, to your point, when I saw the announcement about the domestic abuse, um, it's more press, and I guess they always say any, any kind of press is good press, um, and people are talking about it. Um, but e even in some of the footage, I feel like all the delays has, have kind of caused this game to kind of fall behind and even some of the facial animations that I was seeing, because I was I was thinking, like, even playing Injustice 2, um, the facial animations were better in Injustice 2 than they were in some of these trailers. Um, so to me, I was kind of like, man, this came better really sooner. It's going to fall back in a lot of their facial animations like Andromeda did. So, um, <laughs> I don't know. I can't, even, I can't think about uh, that game. Those, especially the early ones when I first started playing that game before it released. Yeah, I, I didn't even know what was happening. Oh, boy. Anyways, oh, um, yeah, so we'll see what happens with this game. I'm excited about it. I want to play it. I want to see more about it. But if it's another game that controls as bad as Heavy Rain did, I'm going to be really let down. I'm just going to continue to scratch my head because people – are nuts about this developer quantic dream um and their games um, i just if something is a game that is based on quick time events and struggles on the quick timing event control uh is bonkers to me because it's it, it, that there shouldn't be much to a quick time event um but whatever yeah no i get your point and that if that's your focus from your gameplay methodology um that's much easier to make a polished experience than something like Injustice too, uh, you know, a high, high pay. God, neither of us can speak today. A fast-paced fighting game, or something that has very complex controls, you know, like a fast-paced shooter, or a Call of Duty, or something. It's very, it's much easier to make a polished experience when you're just walking around pushing a button here and there. You would think um, yeah. than some of those other games. Okay, closing out um, the ones confirmed for 2018, and we've gone back and forth with the exclusives here. But final exclusive Xbox side this time, uh, State of Decay Two. So State of Decay was an Xbox Live title for the 360. It was a smaller game at the time in the sense from a development perspective, but it became a big, big hit for the Xbox 360, eventually selling over, I, I want to say, 2 million units. I'm going off memory there. Um, and so they've expanded their team. They've expanded the funding. Microsoft has gotten behind them for State of Decay 2, and they have a much larger scope for this title. So this is a combination... Um, zombie game but it's really more of a survival game it is a permadeath game you can play in co-op you can build encampments uh, there's lots of like hunting and looting um but it's a it's a more serious take on the zombie genre more of like if you actually took the walking dead tv show and turned it into a real video game that's more of what this is so 
Um, I know, again, this is one of those games that has a very hardcore following. The people who love State of Decay love it to death. They'll be there day one. But what's going to be interesting to see is if this game can reach a broader audience with uh, the sequel on the Xbox One platform and whether or not, you know, they can really push it into a mainstream audience. Personally, I don't know. I think any game that uh, presents permadeath um, is just a tough sell. Uh, I think, you know, games like... um, What's the survival game I was playing earlier this year that we talked The Long Dark. Um, (laughs) Popular game, hardcore following. There's people that love that game to death. I actually enjoyed it quite a bit once I pushed myself to put the time into it. But it's not a mainstream game. It's not that game that, you know, people are talking about at the game stores or in social media. And so I don't know, you know, just from a sales perspective, what State of Decay is going to do in 2018. But, you know, again, another game that I'm hoping uh, turns out well. Yeah, another game that's been delayed a ton. Unfortunately, this is on the Microsoft side. Um, the trailers look like a blast to watch, and um, I had a, a really close buddy of mine um, love the first one, and he's played it so many times in so many different ways. So I hope it's good. Um, I like. I think I've been very uh, vocal about being over zombie games. <laughs> so I've never uh, heard you say that before. Never, never. <laughs> um, but I, I hope it's good, and if it's if it's awesome, I may pick it up. If it's just more of the same old, same old. Um, I'll pass, but thanks. <laughs> oh, I'm screen capping that one. <laughs> All right, so let's have a, let's close out with a little fun then. So these are uh, future games we know about may be coming in 2018. Are somewhat some of these are expected in 2018, but we don't have confirmation either way. Um, wait, wait, wait! I, I wanted to touch on something really quick um, from confirmed games. So I, I have a few confirmed games that I can't wait for um, in uh, in 2018. And the first one I know is, since you're a big anime fan, Dragon Ball Z Fighters is coming out in January. Um, and if you haven't seen this game, it looks awesome from an anime perspective. I know Ains, you're a big Goku fan. I'm more of a Vegeta guy. Um, but we can't wait to go Super Saiyan in that game together. <laughs> Am I right? No? <laughs> All right, let me move on to my next one. Uh, oh, what? I'm sorry. What were you talking about? <laughs> Uh, Shadow Colossus uh, Remake is going to be out in February. I want to play it again. I haven't touched that. I have the PS3 remaster, but I, I didn't play it again. I just I think I played the first uh, Colossus, and then I didn't continue playing, but I can't wait for that. And then lastly, my favorite RPG from the Super Nintendo area, which I know is sacrilege to a lot of the Final Fantasies, but Secret of Mana uh, Remake is coming out for PlayStation 4, and I'm super excited about that one. Um, and this then, entire this entire segment was a disaster from beginning yeah. to end. I don't know what just happened here. Yeah. And then lastly, Nino <laughs> Kuni Two. Nino Kuni Two. <laughs> Love the first one. It was my favorite RPG from PlayStation Three. I know we have a slightly new team working on it, but it's been delayed again until I think it's March or uh, May or something. But anyways, what were you saying? Ain't something about um, <laughs> let's do something fun because that was a blast. <laughs> um, so let me comment for real on these real quick. Um, so Dragon Ball Fighters, um, I'm no, yeah, it's just not me. I'm not a big anime fan. <laughs> I don't care about Dragon Ball. As Bert was joking, so I I do know people who are going nuts for this. In fact, one of the guys that my good buddy games with said him and his wife both have the highest edition pre-ordered already. So that's me. Um, <laughs> so I I hope it's good. It looks fan- it does look fantastic. It looks just like a cartoon, um, which is amazing. I mean, the animation and the art style looks cool. So I hope it's really good. Um, what was the other Shadow of Colossus? So I actually forgot about this one. I have the special edition already pre-ordered. Um, I never played the game. I've heard great things about it. Obviously, this is going to be the definitive way to play it for the first time, which I'm excited about. So uh, yeah, looking forward to that one. Um, Nino Nino Kuni Two. Uh, I actually have pre-ordered as well. So uh, I love a good Japanese role-playing game. I do draw the line going back to the whole anime thing. When they get too kind of anime-ish, um, I, I seem to lose interest, which is bizarre because I love Persona 5. But um, I'm looking forward to that one as well. It kind of reminds me, honestly, it gives me that feel of that old um, role-playing game on the Dreamcast. What was this? Uh, Arcadia? Skies of Arcadia? No, Skies of Arcadia. Yep, yeah, 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 um, which was from the Fantasy Star team going way back, which is one of my favorite franchises of all time. Um, so we'll see how that one turns out. And then what was the fourth one you mentioned? Um, was there a fourth? Um, there was, oh, uh, Secret of Mana. 
Secret of Mana, yeah. So um, I liked Secret of Mana, but to your point, uh, I think they're just better Super Nintendo era role playing games. That that was one of the my favorite eras. It might be my favorite era of all time for role playing games, um, especially when you talk about Final Fantasy two and three. So um, we'll see. I don't know if I'll, I'll even have the time to get to that one. But anyway, um, going back to uh, leading into games that may release in twenty eighteen. Um, I, I personally don't think this one will. I, I see it move into 2019, but I had to mention it anyway because beyond Red Dead Redemption 2, it's one of my top three anticipated, and that's The Last of Us 2. Um, the only reason I have this as a maybe for 2018 is because we saw more footage of it at Paris Games Week, and it was footage that nobody expected. It showed a host of new characters. It was incredibly violent and visceral. Um, it caught a lot of press for that reason. Again, I enjoyed it. And um, this is right up there with Red Dead Redemption 2 and another game we'll touch on right at the end here uh, as being my most anticipated games across the whole industry. So I hope we see it next year, but of course I'm willing to wait as long as I need to wait to play it. But I will be there on day one and it'll be another game that um, I probably take time off of work for to just focus on. Uh, simply put, Last of Us 2 is the main thing I'm excited for for future games, regardless of when it's coming. It's the number one. It would be as if like a new Bioshock was coming out with this current generation, which would speaking of uh, which what the f are they waiting for yeah god bioshock with this generation i can't even imagine what that would be like um but yeah uh last of us 2 looks amazing i, I that trailer was funny because we got nothing from ellie and joel uh whatsoever they were just uh, completely new people um but i can't wait i i wonder if uh sony would try to speed up the release date if microsoft had some crazy you know Ace under their sleeve for the fall of 2018, but we have no idea what's coming up for fall yet. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I just, I don't, I, I'm guessing spring 2019 if I was to guess. Yeah, me as well. Me as well. Uh, <clears throat> Ori and the Will of the Wisps. So Ori and the Blind Forest was one of those um, indie games that came out on the Xbox One and became a, a pretty big hit. Uh, it sold well. It's gorgeous. It was an excellent game. And uh, the sequel looks to be, you know, kind of like we were talking about before, bigger and better. So we don't know when this is coming. I would suspect in 2018, they've already been working on it for a while and it's not a AAA game. That being said, it is a small team, Moon Studios, and they are one of a very unique development studio in that they don't have a centralized office. It's a, it's a group of developers that work remotely and uh, you know work together on the title. So we'll see what comes out of this. The E3 presentation of it, I thought was one of the highlights of E3 overall. Um, just opening with piano is always going to get me as a, you know, that's just right up my alley. And uh, it's just a beautiful, gorgeous game. So I'm hoping we see it in 2018 and it's as good as the first one or better. Yeah, really quick here. Love the first one. If you have an HDR TV, buy this game. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, it's stunning. I mean, the the color and the artwork is is amazing. Uh, Metro Exodus. So this debuted at Microsoft Stage D3. We saw it again recently, though the recent uh, the Video Game Awards um, trailer really wasn't that good. But uh, Metro is one of those franchises that, again, has a huge following. Um, I hate saying this out loud, but I have not gotten to either of the first games, despite meaning to several times. Uh, but I really loved what I saw out of this. It looks uh, fantastic. And again, it looks to be that, that bigger scale kind of shooter. Uh, than the first two so we'll we'll see but um we don't know when this is coming again it's expected in 2018 but we'll see yeah i can't believe you haven't played as rtm <laughs> that's that's the main character um from the game i mean i love the first one a lot um it's kind of hard to go back to from a console perspective but if you have a decent pc you should play it on pc because that had all the high-end textures and everything it's still very playable it's still very fun um, the second one I didn't like as much, but um, one thing that was funny to me that I, I heard about the, the trailer for the new one, Exodus, was that a lot of people were trashing on the Game Awards trailer because it didn't look anywhere near as sharp and as amazing as the E3 trailer did. But um, if I'm not mistaken, they were running on a PC, and correct me if I'm wrong, Arians, at the E3 trailer, um, and the latest trailer was not on a PC. I can't remember what the, the mix-up there was or something, but people were kind of let down by that. Yeah, I think... Again, I'm not 100%, so I'll say that right up front. I think there were two things. The one at E3 was running on a PC. However, they said it was running at specs that they could get out of an Xbox One X. That's what it was. So it wasn't like an ultra, you know, double 1080 Ti uh, PC or anything. Um, and then the one at Game Awards was from a different perspective. It was shot differently. The, the direction of it was weird. Um, so I don't know if that just made the difference or what, but 
what have you. I'm sure it'll be a very good game. The first two, you know, were critically acclaimed. And I know uh, yourself and a couple other guys we know, you know, really enjoyed them. So we'll see what comes out of it. Yeah, and the funny thing about this one, there's no official release date at all. It simply says 2018. We don't even know if it's a Q4 or Q3. Yeah, yeah, and it won't. It's another one that won't surprise if it moves into 2019. Um, one of the biggest games for me three, and one of the mo- ones I'm most anticipating is Anthem. Um, and I, it's funny because we joked at the time that this could be the game that basically puts Bungie on check. Because right now they really, there's no other go-to game as a service shooter on consoles that um, you know really competes with Destiny, and there needs to be right. So Anthem looks to be it, and uh, the demo from E3 was stunning. And this, the team behind it is the core Mass Effect trilogy team with Casey Hudson coming back, who wrote the original Mass Effects. Um, it, it seems like all the stars are aligning for this game to be just a juggernaut. Um, you have a, an excellent development team uh, that has some of the best pedigree across the entire industry. If you think about Mass Effect 1 and 2, I mean, forget about it. They're some of the greatest games ever made. Um, combined with, you know, near unlimited funding, they've been working on this for apparently already over four years. And, um, you know, they've got all the time to just come out and really, uh, really shake things up. So it'll be interesting to see. I hope it lives up to expectations. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if you've read this at all, but I have been hearing that Anthem's having some developer issues. I don't know what that means or what's going on. Um, I do know that the original um, forecasted release date is changing a lot, and I think we'll be hearing more about it at E3, if not before then. But I, I hope that they get their act together over there. Um, it seems like there's constant issues with development. And another game from EA that's probably going to be not releasing the way it should. But, yeah, to your point, this is supposed to be the Destiny competition Uh, from that perspective but that trailer looked awesome i hope it's something like that i'm willing to bet it's going to be nothing like that though (laughs) yeah they did say uh they officially did change the release date schedule right into fiscal year 2019 i believe which could technically push release out to march 31st of 2019 um so we'll see I, i again we don't know like i said these are all unconfirmed um, next one, one probably my favorite Telltale game um, was a huge surprise and uh, love that we heard it's getting a sequel, and that's Wolf Among Us. So Wolf Among Us Season 2 is expected next year, and uh, it's a day one buy for me. Absolutely adore the first one. Thought it was fantastic and can't wait to dive back in. Yeah, outside of the Walking Dead series, that you know, what is it on, four chapters now, or the third chapter with Clementine? Um, Wolf Among Us was my favorite, followed closely, and this is how good the other one is, but Tales from Borderland is fantastic if you haven't given that one a try yet. But um, I can't wait for it. I love the subject material that's used in this story, um, and kind of all the, the fairy tales that exist in it is just great. So I can't wait for it. But I, I don't, we haven't seen anything for it, just a teaser uh, title. Yeah. So, yeah. Don't know anything. Now, here's one I'm pulling out of the, the hat, and that's Below. So people are probably like, what the hell is Below? Um, I wouldn't blame you if you said that, because this is a game made by Cappy Games that was said to be similar to a Dark Souls-like Zelda, um, which is really weird combination. And it debuted at Microsoft Stage in 2013. Um, so that shows you how long it's, it's been going, especially for an indie title. However, Cappy Games has, has confirmed that the game is still alive. Um, it's They're just taking their time with it. And, uh, you know, some of the people I listened to or talked to within the industry actually said they have played it recently. They played it at uh, an event a couple months ago and said it's, it's coming along well. So we'll see if we get this in 2018. I'm hoping we do. It looked really neat from the original trailer. And uh, Cappy Games makes some good stuff despite being a smaller studio. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Any roguelike that has a procedural generation and the kind of dungeon and loot hunting uh, is right up my alley. I know nothing about that game whatsoever. <laughs> so um, I think I vaguely remember the trailer and I remember you were going crazy about it. But I think the reason it turned me off is because Dark Souls and Bloodborne I struggle with just because I'm not as good as a gamer as you are with that kind of stuff. And um I think I kind of turned myself off to it, so I, I don't know anything about it. And well, and you don't really care for Zelda like I do, so um, that's okay. We can we can move on. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, this is a rumor uh, that came out, but it's got a lot of um, validity behind it. We think anyway. We don't usually speculate on rumors, but this one is pretty solid, and that is uh, that Battlefield will be back in 2018, and it will be Battlefield Bad Company Three. 
And for people like myself who adored Bad Company 2 from a multiplayer side, um, we are ecstatic about this. So Battlefield Bad Company 2 is still my favorite Battlefield game of all time. Um, it's simply fantastic. And the rumor is that, uh, like I said, that 3 is going to be the game that shows up next year. We had already heard earlier in the year that Battlefield would be back in 2018. But now there's a lot of uh, data and kind of... Um, you know, insight from various people within the industry that it is going to be Bad Company 3 and that it's going to take place around the Cold War time. So what that means in terms of, uh, you know, campaign or weaponry or who's going to be in it, we don't know, but uh, it could be really, really good. So I hope this one's true. Yeah, Bad Company was um, kind of my favorite uh, stories from the Battlefield games. Um, I really struggled with Battlefield 1 stories. They were just different chapters of different times, but they weren't bad. They were just not my favorite. Um, so we'll see what that comes like, and, and we like the multiplayer a ton on it. With that being said, it'd be interesting to see what the Call of Duty game is this year. Rumors with that one is that they might be going to Vietnam um, with their time scale, um, but I don't know. I, I, we we know nothing about it whatsoever. Usually stuff starts to peak out in late spring as to what Call of Duty is going to be doing, but those two uh, titles and, and developers going back and forth, it's always interesting, and I like the competition between the two, even though they're not anything similar to each other, <laughs> aside from being a shooter. Yeah, it'll be interesting because Vietnam is uh, the Vietnam expansion for um, Bad Company 2 is one of my favorite multiplayer expansions ever in any shooter. And um, if Call of Duty goes to Vietnam and Battlefield goes to Cold War and they're released the same year, that could really be a great year for shooters, especially if you consider that we very likely will get Halo 6 uh, in 2018, fall of 2018, if the schedule holds true for what you know the development cycle has been for 343. So we may as well move into that one. Um, we don't know anything about Halo 6. Uh, the only thing coming from a Halo fan's perspective that we do know, which was just announced last week, is that for the competitive Halo gaming scene, they are teaming back up with Major League Gaming. So uh, 343 had a contract with ESL, and um, it just, uh, you know, within the competitive gamers, the people who are really in the Halo competitive scene, they didn't feel it was really working too well. They felt that uh, they were being let down at some of the events, that it really wasn't taken care of well or handled well. And so the big hope was that they would team back up with Major League Gaming for 2018 World Championship and beyond. And 343 announced last week that they are doing that. So this was actually really big news for the franchise. Um, but other than that, from a campaign, from a writing perspective, we know that Josh Holmes is gone from 343. And um, we really don't know. You know, we kind of thought we may get a teaser for it th at this year's E3. We didn't. And so either right now we're looking at something where we see a teaser um, at E3 2018 and we don't get the game till 2019. Or, you know, we see a full-on trailer at, 20, uh, at E3 2018 and the game releases next fall as anticipated. But it's too early for Gears of War 5 to come next year. So if they don't do Halo 6 uh, in 2018, it's going to be really interesting to see where uh, Halo 6 and Gears 5 end up. Yeah, especially if they're going to be competing against each other in that weird uh, fall season that they would have to release in. But I don't know. I have a feeling we're still going to see Halo um, in some form at E3 this year. It kind of has to be if you think about it. But, but The other thing I'd heard is that this next one, and I think this was talked about a little bit further down the road, um, is that Chief will be a lot more of the main character versus the multi-storyline that they had on the last one. Um, I don't know. I, I, man, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. Can you imagine Halo on the Xbox One X with that kind of development in mind? It's going to be mind-blowing. So Yeah, and they've, they've got a lot to clean up. Um, again, we won't get into it because you know me. I'll go on forever about this. But they've got a lot to clean up from a campaign and story writing perspective. They got really messy in Halo 5. They got a lot of... Uh, negative feedback from fans about it and uh it, it's that reason why i think they may take longer with this development cycle because they know that they've got to nail halo 6. halo 5's multiplayer was brilliant they implemented rec packs very well i still think you know probably one of the best implementations of loot boxes for lack of a better word uh in a game lately and um but the campaign was messy and i i know that 343 thinks they've got to get this right Plus, keep in mind that 343 has already announced that they're working with another studio on completely revamping the Master Chief collection in 2018. Yep. So if they are you know, cleaning that up and, and kind of re-releasing it or relaunching it, whatever you want to call it, to make it the AAA experience, it should have been a launch. Um, it won't surprise me to see 
more of a build up in timeline delay uh, for Halo 6 moving into 2019, but we'll see. Yep, I mean, it's, we, we both can't wait for it. So I think we're kind of done with Halo Wars for a while. So I think the Halo shooting franchise has to come back in some form. So we'll see what that is. Yeah. Uh, so we, we touched real briefly on these earlier, but we were kind of going through the unconfirmed list or even the confirmed list for 2018. And we we were talking about how well the Switch did in 2017 in terms of sales, in terms of third-party support. And Zelda and Mario go without saying. Um, but we were looking at 2018 and we're thinking, hmm, there was really nothing big announced, especially from a first party perspective. We know that there's a Yoshi game in the works. Uh, Bayonetta 3 was announced at the Game Awards as an exclusive, but no release date. And we know that Metroid Prime 4 is coming. Um, but none of these things have release dates, and we don't know when they're coming. So I, I personally don't foresee Metroid Prime 4 coming in 2018, but I think it would be neat if it did. Um, Bayonetta 3, I'm not sure. But uh, you know, what do we think from a Switch perspective? Yeah, I have a feeling we're going to see some more Wii U ports um, coming to the Switch to kind of write out that. And also the ports from last generation with a few updates, kind of like your LA Noirs, um, your Dooms and stuff. I think that'll kind of ride Nintendo Switch throughout the beginning of 2018. Um, and then come uh, summer of 2018, I think we'll start seeing some, um, some first-party stuff that'll kind of blow people away, like Yoshi and, and maybe something else. Sounds kind of funny to say Yoshi will blow people away. But <laughs> I think... Uh, <laughs> I think that's that. I mean, there's really nothing else, and that's what I, if I remember reading something, Nintendo was projecting that they were going to be selling over 25 million by the end of uh, 2018. I'm not sure if they're going to have the same crazy year that they had in 2017. Because I mean, if you think about it, the top rated games of 2017 were Zelda and Mario. I can't think of any other first party game that's coming from Nintendo that's going to do that in 2018 yet. I mean, we're still obviously super early. We had no idea how good Breath of the Wild or Mario Odyssey was going to be at this point last year. Um, but at least we knew they were coming. Um, so I I don't know. Maybe another Mario Kart's coming. If you think about it, we really haven't had a new Mario Kart since 2014. Um, the last one was a port of the Wii U version. So maybe that's coming. I don't know. Um, there's got to be something coming that they are hiding really, really well. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. I think one of the ports we'll see, or at least a remaster, upgrade, what have you, is Smash Brothers. Um, yep. I think we've got to see that soon. Uh, your mention of Mario Kart's interesting because I really hope, and you and I will agree on this. I know. I really hope they wait to have the new Mario Kart until their online service is up and running and properly functional. Yep. Um, if uh, I'll say it right now, if Mario Kart releases nine, whatever it is, releases, and there's not an online competitive component that you can play with friends, I'm not buying it. It's just not worth it to me because I don't, you know, I don't play it with anyone locally. Um, so it, much of the enjoyment of that game for me is playing with other people. And I did that with my sons, Mario Kart 8, but you know, they're just not into it as much as me, which is kind of funny to say. Um, but I would love to play with you and people online. Um, on my friends list on, on Nintendo, but until they get that online component fixed up, it's not going to be worth it. Yeah, and I, come to think of it, I was uh, funny enough, I was on my Switch last night because we were playing some Tetris Battle with uh, with all the guys here. But I remember uh, on the demo, remember that Project Octopus Traveler? Yeah, 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 yeah it looks good. Um, Real good. I don't know if that's going to be one of their main releases. I love the art style and the way that played. But even then, I mean, they, they're going to have to release some new stuff for people to continue to ride on the way that they've been riding on. Because, I mean, they've... They've gotten away with a lot. If you think about it, they only had four main exclusives all year. Um, they were all fantastic, with the exception of us not really loving Splatoon. Um, or I don't, I don't think we disliked ARMS, but we didn't love it to where we had to play it every day or something. It's not, it doesn't have the legs of the game. It's got the ARMS, though. <laughs> I knew that was coming. As soon as you said it, I was like, here we go. It's coming. But, uh, no, I mean, I, you know what I meant. Um, I don't know. I just... I feel like Nintendo's got to do something. Maybe their virtual console will release when the drought starts. They're like, oh my God, we can play Super Nintendo and GameCube games here. And then the whole cycle starts all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like, man, Nintendo, you're either the dumbest company in the world or the smartest, and we're just too stupid to realize that that's what's going to happen. But, all right. Yeah. And then uh, one I had on here just for fun. Um, there's not even been an inclination or inkling that this is going to release in 2018, and I don't even think it will. Um, but when I was talking about my top three most anticipated games, um, Halo is in its own category. You can always assume Halo is number one. Um, but Red Dead Redemption 2, Last of Us 2, and then Cyberpunk 2077. So as I've made uh, abundantly you know, clear 
Um, Witcher 3 is uh, my favorite game of all time. I'm playing it again. And Cyberpunk 2077 is from that team, even bigger team, even bigger development budget. Um, they have said that the world is bigger than Witcher 3 in it. They've been working on this game for going on three to four years already. And um, everything CD Projekt Red has done over the past three years or so has been absolute gold. Um, so I just open world sci-fi role playing game that has, you know, um, a world bigger than Witcher 3 with uh, full RPG mechanics is, I don't know, I may lose my job when that game comes out, to be honest with you. I, I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's just everything points to that game being just a, a genre defining or even, you know, industry changing title. Yep. I mean, um, I don't know anything outside from the one teaser that they had, but that game is even going to play like. Um, but I can't wait either. It's uh, it's up there for me. Witcher Three is in my top three games of all time. It might even be the best one. I don't I don't really know to be honest, but um, it's it's up there, so I can't wait. Um, I did have a couple that we we didn't initially talk about that I'm really excited for potentially in 2018 because we don't know if they're releasing. Yeah, um, at E3, um, the Xbox Reel they had a game called Last Night. Mm -hmm. that um, I can't wait. It was my favorite trailer from E3, and it was only like about a minute and 30 seconds, but the music was amazing. The art style was amazing. And then funny enough, I don't, we don't usually give props to anybody, uh, other sites that, because obviously we, we don't really do that, but IGN did a, a really nice video with the developers of the game, and they talked about it, and it was probably one of the best videos I've ever seen when they are talking to developers and sharing their development cycle. So if you haven't seen it, uh, just do, I think it's Last Night IGN or something that you should search for. And they did um, the whole journey, I think it was called, or something like that, of it. And I can't wait. So I, I don't think we had an official date. I think they were aiming for the end of 2018. I can't wait for it. It looks awesome. Um, and it's it's it was just a gorgeous uh, thing. The second one that is we know nothing about, but it's rumored to be in 2018, is a new Tomb Raider. Um, I hope it's good. Um, you know, it's the Rise of the Tomb Raider got the 4K enhancements, and that game looks glorious on there. So if uh, they have another game they're working on that'll be designed in 4K and not simply, you know, with new textures or, or frame rate increases, I, I hope that's going to run at a full 4K 60 FPS when that releases. And I kind of want to see where the new uh, Lara is going in her story um, with what's happening, and that should round out the end of the trilogy. So um, I, I tend to enjoy the new Tomb Raider series more than the new Uncharted series that they've kind of gone to with Uncharted 4. And um, how was the most recent one? I even played it this year with the... Uh, Lost with, Legacy. Uh, Chloe? Um, yeah, yeah, Lost Legacy. I, I enjoyed Rise of the Tomb Raider more than I did Lost Legacy, and Uncharted 4 had a lot of slow parts for me to where I ended up liking Rise of the Tomb Raider more than that as well. So um, we'll see what happens with those. I can't wait for any kind of announcement or any details whatsoever for the new one. I hope it's good. Um, and I think it's going to come out in 2018. So that's why I think it's there for me. Yeah, um, uh, that's kind of my fault for leaving that one off the list. Because uh, we even talked about, I believe, on the last big cast around Ubisoft mentioning that we're going to see a lot of Lara in 2018, which just makes sense given the movie release as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that would the game would release shortly after. So we can 99% assume the game's going to release in... Uh, cool in 2018 and on top of that there was uh in a leaked press thing for it there was an acronym that was like st you know t r something of that nature so pretty much confirming shadow of the doom raider so as the title um the last night um that's what it was right mm -hmm. last, night. last night yeah the trailer was really cool it reminded me of a new um out of this world or flashback games from our 16-bit generation um, it looks really, really cool. It's gotten a ton of play. If you look at like the uh, views on that trailer versus some of the other trailers to me three, it's way up there. Simply, as you said, it looked gorgeous and really unique and the music's fantastic. So i um, looking forward to that one as well. And then uh, lastly, beyond all the stuff we already talked about, I was just going to say, don't sleep on uh, Ashen. So Ashen looks really unique, kind of oh, like yeah. a, um, again, almost Souls-ish, but with uh, apparently more exploring um, to it. And it, it's. I haven't seen anyone play it other than the trailers, but some of the people that have played it and commented on the game all have come away raving about it. So whether or not that's 2018, I'm not sure, but I'm hearing more and more about that game as time goes on. So we'll we'll see. But I think that that could turn out really well. Yeah, the other one that's a, like a Souls game is Project Vein. Um, that's due yeah. 2018. Um, that looks cool, but I, I from what I heard, it's really hard. So that uh, might be a struggle for me. But um. 
Maybe yeah, and I don't I don't know what they're gonna do. It's got that anime look to it, so it depends. <laughs> it depends how deep they go into the the whole anime thing with it, whether or not I love it, because I love the Souls games. But part of why I love the Souls games is the art direction. You know, I love that dark. Um, uh, you know, um, can't remember the, the name. Yep. Yeah, medieval kind of feel. You know, um, I love that. Um, and if they they just take that and go anime with it, well, you've just made the game worse. It might. <laughs> In my opinion, so we'll see. Really comes off like I hate anime, doesn't it? I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> all right, so um, I think that's about all we had for our holiday special here. Uh, it actually, we ran longer than I, uh, I thought we would. Just a lot to talk about already to get excited for with 2018, and we'll see if 2018 tops 2017, um, knowing how great the year has been for games. So... Before we close out, I did want to say a very uh, kind of sincere and honest thank you to all of the people who have been listening to our podcast, um, who have been watching, who have subscribed to our YouTube channel. You know, we've gained uh, a lot of exposure this year and our, our kind of visitor count and our views and everything have um, really grown in 2017, uh, you know, comparatively to 2016. And obviously that's something we wanted and we're going to keep working on. Right. So um, a very sincere thank you anyone that uh that tunes in and checks our stuff out as we always say we are very open to feedback if there's something we can be doing better if um you know there's something you'd like to see or want to hear about that we may have played that you haven't uh please let us know we're happy to talk about it and uh, i will just say that we have some good things planned for 2018 already um there's going to be things happening on the site we're going to be posting more videos on the youtube channel um and if uh you know you would stay tuned on those things please subscribe like it it just really, um, it really makes us feel good that people are checking it out and gives us incentive, obviously, to, to continue to work harder on, on things for you. So um, just wanted to put that out there. Bert, anything you want to say before we close out? No, thank you as well. Um, as you know, we, we started out kind of small and we don't, we don't do this for a living. We're not like some of the sites that, you know, this is what they do. They make videos two or three times a, a week or anything. So I appreciate you guys letting us do this as a hobby and then kind of informing everybody as well. Um, if there's any ideas for videos that you guys might like for us to do or cover or show, I know we've had some some funny requests that people have been wanting to see our, our game rooms or our, I guess our backgrounds that we have or like what we do or, or where we play our games. Um, maybe that may be something we could do kind of like our video game cribs or something. <laughs> um, so we actually have had a couple of those requests. But if there's anything that uh, we're playing or something and you want us to dive deeper on them, uh, we'd love to get your feedback on that um, and we can put those together for you. So uh, thanks for listening or watching if you're watching on YouTube. And just if you are doing any of just remember to give us a like or any kind of that stuff. It really helps us out to kind of let us know what we're doing well and what we're doing not too well. So thanks again. Appreciate it, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays to you. And we'll see you in 2018.